This is a photo of a piece that is in my studio. It's a small piece, about 16 by 12 by 16 inches. The piece is made out of cardboard, chicken wire, felt, sculptor mold, house paint, tin foil, and these foam noodles that you buy for the swimming pool. Some of the parts are very fragile, but then it's tied together with a thin band of chicken wire, so it's a bit menacing, isn't it? The piece is called Gifts and Preoccupations, and it's one of a series. The, the piece sits on something like a pedestal, <coughs> only it's made out of two cardboard boxes that have been painted with white house paint. It's important to me that the pedestal is made of boxes because, first of all, the box is essentially the same material or the same class of material that uh, class of material as the materials that make up the piece. Some of the ideas that animate th this work will make up the threads that run through my talk this evening. My father and mother were art students. They both attended Chenard Art Institute in Los Angeles, which is where they met. My father, like many art students of his day, went to school on the GI Bill. Chenard was more a um, professional school rather than a liberal arts college. And when he left it, he went on to become a successful graphic designer. But early in his career as the art director for Columbia Records, he occasionally got the chance to include his own paintings into his graphic designs. Time out, Dave Brubeck. Painting by S. Neil Fujita. <laughs> and Mingus Alam. When my father died in, in 2008, the New York Times published an obituary. And in it, Milton Glaser wrote that my father's work, quote, was a kind of synthesis of Bauhaus principles and Japanese sensibility. I'm not sure about this opinion, whether it's true or insightful. It's definitely not something I would have thought about 20 years ago. But I do know that for some reason now, I've been thinking about it, what it says about my father's work, and maybe even mine as well. This is a brochure for a show called The Green Mountain Boys that was at Andre Emmert Gallery in 1998. It was a group show featuring the art of Kenneth Noland, Jules Olitsky, Paul Feely, and Anthony Caro. In the mid-60s, Andre Emmert was one of the most important galleries for contemporary art, and, the, and, and these artists were represented by this gallery, at least I think most of them. All of them also had roots in the Bennington, in the Bennington area, having lived there or taught at the college. So the Green Mountain refers to that part of Vermont that Bennington is situated in. The critic Clement Greenberg was also um, a strong presence there. When I entered Bennington in 1973, almost all the faculty associated with that period had moved on, many to Hunter. But the ones that remained still retained a strong affinity to the work of those artists and to Greenberg's ideas. For instance, the most important teacher I had there, Sidney Tillam, liked to speak of Greenberg and Sigmund Freud as being the two most important writers he had ever read. I have some question marks that followed that statement. <laughs> Wonderment. One of Greenberg's most important essays was Modernist Painting. In it, he laid out the terms by which painting could be thought of as modern. Essentially, the process involved identifying what the defining properties of painting were, its self-consciousness, its flatness, and the privileging of the optical color over drawing. Seen in this light, what made a painting a painting was not the presence of abstract forms or non-representational color, but rather the absence of anything extraneous to painting's essential properties. It was a form of addition through subtraction. 
Armed with this recipe for good painting, one could analyze the entire history of painting and figure out which painters were closer or further away from this idea. The trajectory, which had started out messily, could now move towards a form of painting that is the clearest and purest expression of its nature. This is the narrative that directed us to see how Cezanne could lead to Picasso, Brock, Matisse, and Miro, and how those artists could lead to the abstract expressionists, Pollock and de Kooning, etc., and how those artists could lead to the color field painters, Nolan, Olitsky, Feely, and Helen Frankenthaler. This is a painting by Helen Frankenthaler titled Small Paradise. This was a self-assured narrative, and the fact that it wound up at the doorstep of Bennington with the color field artists made it that much more, more authoritative, I guess, to me. I was going to say compelling, but I wasn't necessarily compelled by it. Um, but at the age of 18, I wasn't even aware that modernism could have a narrative. The only thing I knew was the, moder the Museum of Modern Art, and that museum seemed to have a plan. It started with Cezanne and ended with the color field painters, with lots of side rooms devoted to other important, but maybe not as important, art movements. In the meantime, there were a lot of artists that I began to look at, starting with the Kooning, Hoffman, and Franz Klein. I remember borrowing The Triumph of American Painting by Irving Sandler and looking at paintings by Klein. This one is called By Klein Mahoning from 1956. The work had a sense of urgency. It seemed to be asking, even demanding, that I stay in front of it. The critic Harold Rosenberg <coughs> said in his essay, quote, American action painters, oh, excuse me, the critic Harold Rosenberg said in his essay, American Action Painters, that, quote, the canvas began to appear as an arena in which to act rather than as a space in which to reproduce. And again, I have several question marks that follow that statement. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. But I also began to look at the work of other artists who didn't cleanly fit the criteria of either Greenberg or Rosenberg, such as Jasper Johns, Frank Stella, and Donald Judd. This is a picture of Bennington, the mid-70s. Sometime in the middle of my second year, I was, quote, accepted into the Bennington Art Department, and that prompted a change. Now I was being treated as an artist, and the, fa and the fact that I was a student now seemed secondary. I remember being resistant to this. What if I'm not ready to be an artist, much less assume the identity of an artist? I suspected that there might even be an ulterior motive because, or because it might possibly burnish the self-image of the teachers themselves. They weren't teaching students anymore. They were teaching artists. But never underestimate the power of speech. To be called an artist is a powerful act of recognition and being taken seriously was actually very meaningful to me at that time. But what if your teachers decide to call you an artist? The problem will always be, what kind of art are you going to make? I remember making quite a few abstract expressionist style paintings with acrylic and modeling paste that I was pleased with. I also remember making a strange figurative painting, a portrait of a friend holding a pair of bird's wings under an arch that looked a lot like a thin rainbow. It was like a cross between a Jasper Johns and Caustic and some early Renaissance um, portrait painting. And then there was the 40-foot long sculpture. I had a classmate who took a, sem a semester off to go to the Whitney Independent Study Program. And after he returned, he got another Whitney Program alum, John Newman, to come to Bennington to teach for a semester. I wasn't a very good student of his, but I did make a 40-foot sculpture. And here's the story. A couple of friends and I had decided to drive to Yale to hear Jacques Derrida speak. We were taking a philosophy class, and Derrida's writing was on our reading list. The evening at Yale was uneventful for me because the lecture was given in French. <laughs> and I don't speak French. 
On our way back to Vermont, I had a kind of half-awake, half-asleep vision of reflective orange plastic drums that lined sites where road work is going on. I envisioned these drums in my half-awake state as a long, strange, continuous black, white, and orange line. It was a vision that was hard to get out of my head. The next day, I decided to make it with 10 pieces of sheetrock, some particle board, and some orange and black paint. When Newman saw it the next day, he said, oh, this is great. I want you to apply to the Whitney program. And this is what got me in, miraculously. It was one of those unexpected moments that took on a much greater significance because it was one of these direction-changing moments. The Whitney program today is, in many ways, very different than it was when I was there, with the one important constant being Ron Clark, who started the program in 1968. Today, the Whitney ISP is largely made up of students who may have already received their MFAs and already have an engagement with some form of cultural work. The program's intellectual center is the seminar reading group led by Clark. When I was there, there were students like me who were still undergrads, still in the process of figuring out what we were doing. In addition to Clark, the teaching staff also included Yvonne Rayner, who was on leave for one semester, replaced by Joan Jonas, Laurie Anderson, and Amy Taubin, Amy Taubin and David Diao. And compared to the studios that the ISP occupies now, the studios at that time were large open spaces in the basement of an old bank on Reed Street. Yes, most of the students were doing some kind of non-painting practice, either writing, working on films and videos, or making objects of some kind. But there were several painters, I was one of them, and it would be hard to forget the importance of David Diao. It was through him that conversations about abstract art could occur. He was a link to forms of radical painting that had its roots in Russian constructivism. This is a painting of David's entitled Remade in the USA. It's actually a, re, a remaking of a bigger painting that he made in 77. This is from uh, 2012, I think. Very small. Um, the key was Clark's engagement with certain kinds of art making because his vision was the pedagogical center of the program and what it stood for. The fact that he approved of some forms of abstraction or formal art as he called it, may seem surprising to those pe some people who are familiar with the ISP now. But it's important to note and acknowledge that in the earlier days, it was possible for Clark to imagine abstract art making as a radical art form. In fact, that, in fact, Clark felt that Donald Judd was a radical artist. By the time the program moved to Broadway in the early 80s, its identity as a studio program focusing on cultural work took form. But the earlier days were different. Students were younger, and painting was still a practice that was possible. In 1982, I moved my studio to Havemeyer Street in Williamsburg and began working on a number of more three-dimensional works, which I still called painting, even though they were increasingly more volumetric. I was also using the series in a different way, such as making pieces that progressed from small to large accompanied by small shifts in color and design. These are three um, just doodles from my sketchbook from that time. It was around this time that in 1983, um, Heim Steinbach gave me a photo titled Shelf Arrangement for Audrey and Dick for Audrey and Dick's Living Room, Ossining, New York. The photo showed one of his wall sculptures, a shelf-like object made out of scraps of old painted pseudo-antique furniture with a top surface of three-quarter inch varnished plywood. Sitting atop the plywood surface was a skull. It's hard to tell, but the skull might have been functional. It might have had a lid. Just below this wall sculpture to the left was an upholstered chair with striped fabric, and to the right was a tall dining room cabinet. Inside the glass enclosure sat a large metal plate, what looked like a pewter jug, and a number of small Mexican clay figurines. 
I like these early pieces of his. They were messy and expressive, but not abstract, expressionisty expressive. They had a weird matter of factness about them. Maybe that's because they were shelves with objects, even more than they were sculptures. In any case, Steinbach's use of messily constructed shelf with singular object made me think about my work in a new way. It allowed me to consider using a range of things made differently. I thought about the old and the new, the unconscious and the conscious. I thought about what would happen if this combining could make you could could make it uh, could could feel like it was happening by itself. What would it be like to just make some moves that would seemingly allow the work to start making itself? There was more than a bit of fiction in this, but no matter what, there was something about these early works of Steinbach that enabled me to break free of the minimalist control that had held me for some time. I'm going to show you three pieces from around 1983 that were the first pieces that had what I wanted. The f first piece, this is untitled from 1983. The first piece originated with the detritus of an earlier piece that had failed. On an impulse, I just stuffed it into an opening under a geometric construction that I was also working on. Another untitled piece. In the second piece, I arranged three clean white cubes that went progressively from small to large so that they could contrast with the distressed construction it was resting on. In both pieces, my goal was to create something new that could rest on something old. This third piece from 84, titled The Tools of Ignorance, was similar, but in the case, but in this case, I used the comparing and contrasting of forms differently. The first part of the piece was a construction consisting of pieces of an old work mashed together. I had made a number of clean, triangular forms that had been painted black and white. These forms took on a parasitic relation to the structure of bashed in wood fragments. They were like barnacles resting on a worn surface. It was a variation on figure and ground. This is a quote taken from one of my old sketchbooks, the same old sketchbook, by Umberto Baccioni from 1912. Quote, the sculptor can use 20 different materials or even more in a single work, provided that the plastic emotion requires it. Glass, wood, cardboard, cement, concrete, horsehair, leather, cloth. By 1986, I had moved my studio to North 6th Street, and I was asking these questions. What if I go to Canal Street and buy black rubber, cut it into short lengths, and use it like a drawing line? What if I take a sheet of galvanized sheet metal, cut out shapes that look like old tabs for soda cans, and dip them in battery acid? What if I take some shapes made out of poplar, go to a commercial vacuum forming plant and vacuum form 3D shapes that look like containers you would buy in a garden supply store? These questions seem specific to the time of their being made, where I lived in Brooklyn and what I was thinking about. It's what was in the air. So the first piece, is entitled Last Detail, and it's from 1985. And it's about this big, it's a wall construction made mostly out of plywood, some of it painted with black rubber that's been screwed onto the surfaces with sheetrock screws. Oh, and importantly, there's a, there are these two metal posts that the piece slides onto. I'll talk about that later. The second piece is called um, Jawbreaker from 1987. And it's about this big. Um, and again, it's got, oh, well, this time it has black rubber industrial hose screwed onto different 
pieces of wood. Some of the wood is made out of um, wiggle board, laminated together to form these different curves. Um, and then the tabs of um, galvanized sheet metal dipped in battery acid. The third piece is air plant from 88. And this piece, again, has a different as industrial hose, plywood, and these vacuum formed plastic shapes that were glued together. Thank you, Google Street View. <laughs> My studio on North 6th Street was in a five-story factory building overlooking the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. When I was working there, the building itself was continuously in need of repairs, which the landlord never made. There was a rumor that the building was surrounded by toxic chemicals, possibly cobalt, in the soil, discovered by Con Ed workers who were doing some excavation. This rumor, along with daily inhalations of car fumes from the stall traffic on the BQE just outside my window, could have turned my imaginary studio landscape into something fraught with unknowable peril. But instead, it fed the work. The move into this studio coincided with my using those materials that I just described, black rubber, vacuum-formed plastic, sheet metal etched with battery acid. They weren't being used for their functional qualities. They were my versions of the cast-off object, compost made of the made, found, and bought industrial stuff that seemed part of Williamsburg in the 1980s. This is a photograph by Carl Blossfeld. Carl Blossfeld was an early 20th century German photographer whose art forms in nature were images of plant life in which he used a homemade camera to magnify his subjects. I was drawn to the images and patterns and the way that his works did not try to create the emotion using dramatic lighting, camera angles, backgrounds, or storylines. It was just botanical specimens photographed on a plain, unremarkable background. I liked the matter-of-factness of these images and became conscious of the organic-looking elements in my own work, suggesting that if you had the right elements to play with, the organic-looking forms could seemingly multiply on their own. more sketchbook doodles. The work I was doing at this time was taking in different aspects of the culture. Yes, I was making work that used some formal shapes and designs that spoke to the idea of organic growth, but the materials I was using were also reflecting the industrial identity of Williamsburg. This combination of industrial, oops, industrial materials and organic abstraction um, had a bit of a kind of dystopian landscape feeling to it. So you could say that part of it, maybe just a bit, may have been commenting a little on this you know, idea of death, the death of modernism that was you know, in the air. But it may have just been as much about absorbing the industrial landscape and reading science fiction novels. But, um, I also want to just, I've been thinking about that period and thinking about the AIDS crisis that began in the late 70s, early 80s, and just wondering about like when people were really focused on um, this kind of relationship between like the organic and the kind of mutations, like some idea of like the mutation of organic things. I just wonder if there was some kind of consciousness of um, that crisis going on at the same time. In 1997, I moved upstate to upstate New York and had a studio in Kingston, which was not unlike the ones I had in Brooklyn. It was an old factory space in a mixed-use neighborhood, very similar to Williamsburg, only instead of the Manhattan skyline, there was the Catskill Mountains. Just as I was interested in the relationship of materials and process to place in my studios in Williamsburg, 
I was interested in how that shifted when I moved out of the city. And there were other changes as well. In 1994, a daughter was born. And in 2001, we adopted a son from Guatemala. So starting in 1997, these were the questions I was asking. What if I use thin gauge aluminum sheet, laminate both sides with birch veneer and cut into thin strips? What if I take bits of colored pipe cleaners, roll them into tiny balls and glue onto 16 gauge baling wire? What if I take little tabs of painted paper and affix or balance them on pieces of string? The first piece was um, parallel play. Um, parallel play, I don't know, uh, for those of you who have children, um, it's a, um, it's a kind of, I guess, developmental stage and when there's this moment where children learn to play with other children, but they don't play like facing each other. They kind of play, they sort of are kind of parallel to each other. So there's some kind of awareness of the other child, but, um, but without the kind of direct, kind of direct interaction face to face. So, um, this piece is titled Parallel Play. And again, um, you know, part of a bigger series of works. This piece is entitled Air Plant. There was another piece I just showed you was, which was also entitled Air Plant. And um, oftentimes, if I come up on a title that I like, I'll just reuse it. <laughs> Air Plant is actually the the name of a, the title of a Hart Crane poem. And that's nothing to do with the poem. And this is the string piece. It was an installation in an industrial space in the Red Hook, consisting of a piece of string and these painted color uh, paper tabs and bits of um, like Sculpey stuck to that window. And this piece is entitled Systematic Gaiety. And again, I use that title. I've used that title several times for a different series because I like it. Um, and it was the, it was the, it was a line. Uh, um, oh, that escapes me. I'll get back to it. In the mid-19th century, the crystallographer and educator Friedrich Froebel invented a form of schooling for young children that he named kindergarten, which means alternately children's garden or garden of children. The principle behind kindergarten was the education of the mind, body, and spirit by engaging in a system of abstract design activities intended to teach the recognition and appreciation of natural harmony. The goal was to awaken the senses to what Froebel considered to be the God-given structure underlying all growth, animal, vegetable, and mineral in nature. The system of activities that was at the center of Froebel's vision was the 20 Gifts and Occupations, a series of activities designed to stimulate children's curiosity and to activate their ability to think and perceive. This is one of his gifts. This is the first gift. Gifts and occupations, balls. So there were different kinds of things that you could do with them, like different kinds of movements and little sort of drawings that gave you an idea of how they could be used. So the school teachers had both the, the gifts and occupations to hand out, but they also had little diagrams about how they could be used. This one is entitled, well, this is also a gift and occupation. I don't actually know what the subheading is. But again, these, these um, things were, there wasn't anything specific that you had to do. The child was 
free to to experiment with them and to figure out like what what was possible. This one is gifts and occupations blocks. It's actually gifts and occupations, both six and four in this picture. Gifts and occupations seven, parquetry, which I just assume means folding paper or folded paper or cut paper. Gifts and occupations number, oh, I don't know what the number is, but it's drawing. This is a Winslow Homer painting. Gifts and occupations, weaving with paper. And gifts and occupations, peas work. And I guess, well, on the right, as you can see, those are dried peas and toothpicks. And I guess on the left, those aren't peas. Maybe they look like little pieces of cork, maybe. But as you can see in that box, are a little, like a, a pile of dried peas. Norman Brosterman in his book, Inventing Kindergarten, which is where I got these images from, has researched the biographies of, of the, many of the early 20th century artists whose work and ideas have come out of Froebel's educational philosophy. Mondrian, Clay, Kandinsky, Albers, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Buckminster Fuller, among many. In each and every case, Brosterman suggests that their exposure to abstraction was not the result of their having studied it as fully developed artists but rather their exposure to it as children who attended these kindergartens. The following is a quote from Buckminster Fuller. One of my first days at kindergarten, the teacher brought us some toothpicks and semi-dried peas and told us to make structures. With my bad sight, I was used to seeing only bulks. I had no feeling at all about structural lines. The other children who had good eyes were familiar with houses and barns. Because I couldn't see, I naturally had recourse to my other senses. When the teacher told us to make structures, I tried to make something that would work. Pushing and then pulling, I found that the triangle held its shape when nothing else did. The other children made rectilinear structures that seemed to stand up because the peas held them in shape. The teacher called all the other teachers in primary school to look at this triangular structure. I remember being surprised that they were surprised. <laughs> Fuller's geodesic dome. I actually have, I couldn't find it, but I have somewhere a photo of Fuller's first attempt to build a geodesic dome at Black Mountain College. And it was this colossal failure where the thing just kind of like fell flat as a pancake. Um, but this is one of the successful ones. And these are crystal, wooden crystal blocks. Since I discovered Brosterman's book, I've been intrigued by the idea that the roots of abstraction were not simply found in the processes of simplifying or abstracting the more complicated forms that one encountered in the world, but rather these forms, consisting of simple blocks, cylinders, colored pieces of paper, and string, were primary materials, much like a cell is a primary structure. That is one of the threads that connected Froebel's passion for crystals with his educational calling. For him, the vastness of the universe was encoded in the geometry of the smallest crystal, just as the child embodies all the potential of adulthood 
in his or her childhood body. And this is one of the children's, uh, in the book they're called beauties, but this is a kindergartner, uh, a weaving project. I love the idea that abstraction is something that can emerge from the imaginations of children. I love the freedom, if only momentary, from history. In the essay, What is Minor Cinema? Tom Gunning writes about the work of several experimental filmmakers from the late 70s and early 80s. Gunning reflects on the avant-garde and what it stands for. It's a kind of frontline movement, moving in advance of the rest. If we're talking about territory, then the avant-garde is the groundbreaker. Minor cinema, on the other hand, does not seek to break free of the conventions of mainstream, mainstream cinema, but rather finds ways to undermine and challenge it parasitically. As Gunning puts it, a minor culture that is a culture with a marginal existence within a dominant culture redefines the cast-offs, the cast-offs of the masters. I am interested in what it would mean to make abstract art that operates in the margins, much like the way that minor cinema worked for Tom Gunning. What kinds of forms would I need to use, and what are the histories to be addressed? If I look at the work I have done over the past 30 years, there are a few ideas that I have kept returning to. These ideas played out in different forms speak to the willfully marginal stance that I've taken with my work since the beginning. In this last part of my presentation, I will present a group of works from different time periods that addresses some of these ideas. Um, this first little section is called Bearing the Device. And um, it has to do with this idea that um, of wanting to be transparent about how something sort of makes its way up on the wall, and also that without this something, the, the work would fall. It has to be supported by something else. So in this case, from this piece from, the, from 84, it's got that same um, device of drilling two holes, just what I did. I had my piece, and I drilled two holes into the front of the piece, and then had this set, this pair of different, uh, this pair of uh, steel um, posts screwed to the wall. They're welded onto a plate and screwed onto the wall. And then I could take my, skull, my, my piece and just sort of like fit it into the, into these two posts. So I like the idea of somehow like acknowledging or, or, or trying to kind of like show how something ends up on the wall. I then um, wanted to sort of take that further. And this is a piece I did um, several years later where I thought, oh, I need to be more explicit about how something ends up on the wall. So I fashioned this um, aluminum pole, this 12 foot long pole, and attached it with brackets that I made and screwed that into the wall. And then the whole thing was sort of screwed and bracketed and with hinges the piece onto this pole. So the piece itself doesn't touch the wall. It just hangs off this pole and um, I really wanted to like speak to that idea of how something happens on the wall and to be kind of more transparent about that. Of course, I, I showed one of these pieces in a gallery and it was like nobody had a clue. It was complete mystery as to why I did this. So. But that's but I'm telling you the reason. <laughs> and then I did this other series, even later, where I got very interested in the use of hinges. 
and hinges like real hardware that sometimes actually worked and sometimes didn't work. This is a close up. And in each case, there's this sort of just set of two by fours that have been like glued together. And then there's a hinge. And then in some of them, there's this shape that's made out of chicken wire and sculpt the mold that is then the hinge kind of presses against it or into it. And sometimes it crushes it and sometimes it doesn't. And then the other thing, the green thing on top, is again this shape that I made out of uh, hardware cloth and uh, acrylic medium and pigment. And I made these tubes and, and, and fashioned them inside, again, these um, hinged elements. So there was this, there was a, both a kind of, there was this idea of the functionality of these things, but also the non-functionalness. There, there was some kind of like, I was, I was interested, I guess, in the kind of, the question of whether or not, what the, where one could take function. And then I made this series where I just took it as far as it could go, where I just made some fake hinges out of plywood that didn't do anything other than just kind of refer to the idea of a hinge, which you can sort of see on the top of the right wooden thing that's coming off the wall. My next idea, or the next, I guess, theme, has to do with play. And um, in these pieces, um, um, I was interested in, again, like making these structures that had the potential to like work somehow, but that the way they're, the way they actually um, end up on the wall, because of the way the tabs are positioned, they can't really move. So there's, again, this kind of idea that there are functional objects, but, on the, but they aren't at the same time. I was also really interested in, in this idea of drawing and trying to figure out like, how I could sort of translate some of my drawing ideas into pieces. So these wooden discs are, it's, they're attached with strings and then they're eye hooks. And so there's this, you know, whole issue of like weight and balance going on. Not painting, not sculpture. I don't know if you've noticed, but I didn't once call my work either a painting or a sculpture. I will, it, will, it will always be, um, for me, a kind of, there's a, there's, there's a kind of a homelessness, I guess, that I'm interested in. Um, in this case, this piece, which is entitled um, um, Fractured Fairy Tales, um, I worked with like a like a like an existing like a, the shards of a kind of a leftover failed piece, and constructed this thing using a box that was coated with um, aqua resin, which is a water-based resin, which I've been using a lot. Fractured Fairy Tales, for those of you who don't know, is a, a cartoon series from the '60s. Which I think were produced by Jay Ward. They were very um, kind of like low budget cartoons, very beautiful. This piece is called um, The Debris of Life and Mind, which is, which was the image on the poster. Um, And again, part of the same series. 
um, yeah, not a painting, not a sculpture. Something I'm very interested in. And in this case, the the four the the two foot square plywood panel is the thing that literally like supports the piece up off the wall. But then there's this other uh, you can see, oh all right sorry. To the left of that box, you'll see this little white little thing shape. And that white thing were these, I made these, um, this is the strangest part about these pieces, is I made these like, what looked like plaster pillows or cushions that these pieces kind of like rested against. So the piece itself wasn't like attached to the, to the wall, it was all about sort of like leaning and resting. These are uh, pieces that I, that I call um, studies for objects. And um, I'm interested in them because they all refer to, I mean, they all use either like shopping bags or boxes. And I guess I was, one of the things I was really interested in with these pieces is trying to think about um, sort of like the nature of these objects and what they mean, and I guess ideas of um, what you buy from a store and what you might put into a box, the store things, and the fact that a box is often the thing that you use to, to store stuff if you're moving or going from point A to point B, or a shopping bag being the thing that you fill stuff up with to go from here to there. And in this case, those ideas are also contrasted with this idea of things being just sort of like set or settled in a particular place, like unmoving. Like this piece is filled one third with plaster, as is this one. It's just a, it's a cylinder of hardware cloth. And inside the bag is filled with plaster about one third up and the shopping bag has been coated with aqua resin so it's very stiff so it's again this idea of something that's just a bag you know that's completely sort of hardened the last sort of more general kind of Thing that I work with that that's that I was sort of describing earlier has to do with like materials and crafts and what kinds of craft do I use and why do I use it and, and I, I guess I wanted to just sort of point out that um, like the way I use craft it's not I mean there are there are painters for whom like their craft is very serious and um, it's very involved and it's very complicated and my craft is very complicated too, but it comes from a different place. I mean, it might come from like Michael's craft store, craft ideas, as opposed to the art store. This piece is called um, A Brief History of Time. These are all from the same series. From 2010, 2011. I was interested, like with these pieces, I was really interested in trying to think about like when something is on the floor, like what happens to its status as an object. Does it feel more like an object when it's on the floor? And then, so then do you start thinking more about boxes? And then finally, um, going back to the first piece I showed, um, this series, entitled Gifts and Preoccupations. 
And as you might have noticed, the Froebel gifts were his gifts and occupations. So I like this idea of the gifts and preoccupation because it makes me think about like, um, it's like, well, there's something to do, but you're preoccupied with this other thing. You know, so this is sort of like my homage to Froebel. I'm also really interested in the fake pedestal, the fact that it's two boxes. It's really important to me that those are boxes. I'm going to conclude my talk with three questions. What if I take tinfoil, wrap it into little balls, dip it in house paint, brush acrylic, cut it in half, and hammer it flat like a pancake? What if I go to the 99 cent store and buy four foot styrofoam noodles for the swimming pool, cut them in sections, first crosswise and then lengthwise, and coat with aqua resin and fiberglass? What if I buy pieces of felt, then cut them into small pieces and affix to cardboard using a mixture of sculpt -a mold house paint, and white glue? Thank you. One of the titles um, um, one of the titles, one of the shows I had in eighty eight were the um, with the plastic vacuum formed elements. I had named all the titles after different plant diseases, and I guess I liked the idea, and I guess that was a, around that same time that you know I was sort of interested in sort of like this idea of like the organic and but um, thinking about um, at the same time very interested in sort of like things that were like ruptured or, or, or falling apart or somehow coming apart and so the idea of like the plant disease seemed to be like a really for me it was an interesting way to think about both like growth and decay at the same time, which was, some of, which was one of the things I was thinking about. So in some instances, titles kind of fit in a little bit to like the, the meanings of the pieces. But other times, it's just um, like Debris of Life and Mind, which is this line from a, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. It's not, it doesn't have, really have anything to do with the story itself. I mean, it's not, it's not really taking anything of the meaning of the story. But I just loved the, 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 the phrase, debris of life and mind, because it felt like really connected to that piece. So it's usually, I usually sort of pull some other kind of meaning from the, from the title, from where, it's, from where it came from because it just seems to sort of do something. It just, there's, a, there's an interesting kind of friction with the piece itself. But the piece, you know, and I guess for like a lot of you guys, you know, for that this is true of me, that my titles always come after the pieces I make. Um, like Airplant, you know, is a, is a heart crane poem. And I just loved the, the I love that image of there being something that was kind of light and kind of, I don't know, I thought, I thought a lot about like air plant being appropriate for like something that was either light or had something that had some kind of sense of thin walled volume. Um, did I answer your question? 
Oh, oh, the oh. authors. Oh. Is there somebody that you were reading? Just, I mean, the, I mean, I guess at the time I was, um, like, um, a friend of mine had um, directed me to Crash by J.G. Ballard, and there was something about that book that was just very, it just felt like very much like, um, you know, kind of like of the moment. And again, like really connected to like the work I was doing, but not in any way to whatever like morality is, you know, I mean, it wasn't so much about what the meaning of his book was about, but more just sort of like some things that sort of bled out of it. You know, so I would like, I would steal, I mean, it's more like I feel like I'm stealing like titles from uh, William Burroughs books and Ballard and things like that because they just seem to work. Well, I, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I really work in series. I tend to work in series. I mean, I always work in series. So, so usually, I'll use like one title for like the series of works, and then I'll number them. But the way I would distinguish between like air, and my use of the, the title Airplant, which I used on a piece from 1983, you know, a single piece, and a series of those vertical sort of structures with the concrete bases. It's the difference would be simply in the dates. You know, the dates are what mark it as being sort of separate. But otherwise, they're just, they just feel like, oh, I could keep using that title. I mean, still, there's still some, you know, there's something left with that one. But maybe the maybe may, I mean maybe like the year, maybe the date becomes like becomes more important because of it you know because the date, the date is what fixes it you know in a certain you know context. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, it's kind of like um, um, in a way, it's kind of like a sort of like on some level. Well, first of all. Like, I, I just very literally thought about this idea that Frank Lloyd Wright came to his love of geometry and using f and form making and stuff because he went to kindergarten and he specifically says, this was hugely important for me. So it just sort of, a lot of the other artists that Brosterman in his book, like Brosterman makes these, suggests that Mondrian, Kandinsky, Clay, I mean, given their, situ given their upbringings and their history and what he, what, what he could research of their histories, there was every reason to believe they went to kindergarten. Because if they hadn't, it would be really weird and unusual. Because everyone of their class and of their milieu were sending their kids to kindergarten. Therefore, he's inferring that they were influenced by Froebel's gifts and occupations, which I believe, and he believes, but he, I think he's a little bit more in shaky ground than with Frank Lloyd Wright or with Buckminster Fuller, where they're literally referring to specific memories they had. But I do like just love the idea that that these these because if you think about like Mondrian, Mondrian and, and Kandinsky and all these, you think about people for whom like the idea of abstraction comes from an engagement with like a certain kind of history of art, you know, and that sort of like the modernist, the modern, the MoMA narrative, you know, kind of gets you from here to there. And there are all these different sort of conditions that, that, that make that possible. Um, I just, there is just something about the idea that, that some child's exposure to abstraction could be the thing that sort of got them, you know, deeply involved in making abstract art to me is pleasing. I mean, I'm not really, it's, but it's not so much to say that um, I feel like history should be, it's more just sort of like this little kind of, it's just a little bit of a wistful thing, but not so much that I feel it's possible or even, even a good thing.
I mean, one thing I've been kind of reluctant to do is to kind of frame like my work in relationship to Greenberg and Rosenberg um, because um, uh, I don't really think, I don't feel like I'm necessarily like fighting that battle at this time, but, um, but I do feel like and I haven't, you know, read tons of Greenberg, but the things I have read, I've always felt that there was this kind of, I mean, I, I guess it's more of a suspicion, or maybe I've read here and there, that there were certain artists that for him just were not, you know, the fact that they weren't major would, would have been maybe because their work was too slight or somehow too easel-based or too much, um, like somehow the tradition was, it was less about a kind of, I mean, less aggressive and less forthright. Um, like I think about, I remember, I mean, I've told some people this story that when I taught at Princeton, like one year, like Frank Stella came to talk to my class at the museum at Princeton. And he said that one of the things, and, 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 and it's a little incongruous to have like using Stella and plugging them together, but because they were sort of antagonistic, they had an antagonism. But, um, but there were kind of like similarities in sort of sensibility. And Stella said that um, like the thing that he, first of all, like ceramics, weaving, craft, anything of that nature at the museum was like, forget it. He's not even going to like it. He's not even going to bother with it, you know. So, um, and then he said that whenever when he takes his painting and thinks about his painting in relationship to other people's paintings, it's like, what I want to do is I want my work to dominate those other works, and he used that word, dominate. And so I feel like given that, and that wasn't that long ago. This was like in the 90s, you know, this was like. So um, I feel that um, my work, I, I mean, I think that, you know, just from looking at it, I think that you guys can see that, you know, my work doesn't kind of operate in that kind of, in that kind of way. And I think that, um, I was trying to see if I felt like that there were similarities in terms of my attitude or approach to um, some of the filmmakers that Gunning was talking about. And the only one actually that I'm really, whose work I really know is Lewis Clark, who's, an, who's like an animator who does these amazing animations, teaches at um, CalArts, I think. Um, and there's just there's just something very um, there's something about the the way he uses materials and the fact that it's very kind of handmade and not it's not like the there isn't this kind of like idea of mastery that he's using that he's involved in it's collage you know so the only thing that really makes his work go technically is just his persistence to kind of you know make these stop action pieces, which are very time consuming and laborious, but they're not necessarily about having a specific kind of amazing developed skill. See, when I read this thing, like when Milton Glaser, um, you know, I like, do you guys know who Milton Glaser is? He's, he's, at, he's taught at SVA for like 50 years or something. He's, you know, he's a hugely important graphic designer. But when he said that my father's work was this combination of um, synthesis of Bauhaus and Asian sensibility, it's like, you know, there was a time when I was going like, no, I hate this. You know, I don't want, you know, my father's work to be kind of marked as being like Asian influenced. I don't want my work to be marked as Asian influenced. I mean, there was a real, I had a real, um, I had a real, like, sort of, I was very uneasy about, like, being sort of, like, oh, it's an Asian sensibility, you know, and I feel a little bit like, um, 
I don't know if it's the same thing, but I know that, like, for instance, like with Noguchi, who was a Japanese American sculptor, um, he always had this kind of like problem with people, in that when he went to Japan, everyone thought his work was too Western, and they kind of rejected it. And when he was here, you know, everyone thought his work was too Eastern, and he wasn't totally accepted. So, and it's one of those things I suspect, Michael, that, you know, like this is the kind of thing I feel like Greenberg would have a problem with, you know, like what if something was like too Eastern looking? Because I know that he, for instance, had a problem with Mark Toby's work, you know, who was influenced by, and a lot of West Coast painters who were influenced by Asian, Asian art. Um, so, but I guess what I'm, what I was saying at the beginning of my talk was that when I read that thing in 2008 and I've had time to think about it, it's like I actually feel really ready to acknowledge and absorb and accept and everything like those words. Like, you know, I'd, I'd be very happy to accept and take in the idea that, you know, I am, you know, my father's son, and maybe there's some, some, there's some ways in which, without even me sort of being really sort of aware of it, you know, I've taken in some elements of his sensibility. And where does his sensibility come from? You know, um, you know, I mean, partly it was schooling, you know, because art schools in the '40s were often very had a very kind of Bauhaus you know, kind of element to them, like color theory classes and things like that. Um, so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that um, I'm, I feel very open and accepting and welcoming of these kinds of influences that I might have had before I was even ready to say yes or no. And that's why I brought that up about that, that remark of Glazer's. And that's why I wanted to talk about the Bennington thing because, you know, ordinarily I wouldn't be wanting to talk about like college, 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 but it was the fact that it was at a time when I didn't know anything, you know? So it was like, these are the things that were, these were the things that were in the air. And it was sort of like, you could either go yes or no, or it's like, but, and you're doing this yes or no thing all the time, but you're also like taking it in, you know? And it's kind of hard to, like I had painting teachers in school where it was like, I really was annoyed with them. Like they annoyed me, you know? And, um, but then like years later, I've thought, I've really got, I've sort of come around to think, you know, they actually had something really kind of important to teach me, you know? And it's just sometimes it just takes a long time, you know, before you kind of like pick up on that stuff. So that's why I actually spent, you know, a lot of time like talking about the earlier like period of my like education. Well, you know, like in terms of those box pieces, I feel like that's so much like an idea kind of thing. I, I feel like there's less to kind of like grab onto. Whereas in terms of just sort of like design and color and sort of this Bauhaus thing, um, there's some, maybe something to that that I, I, you know, I'm kind of like willing to or ready to take in. But um, I have this friend of mine who teaches at Queens College and she's a poet and she teaches, she's half Japanese, half white, and she's taught like Japanese aesthetics. And she told me once, she said, oh, your, your work is so Japanese. And I'm going, what do you mean? And she said, it's, be, it's the way you like take, it's the when you have your sheetrock screws in your, it's the way you use screws in your wood, the way the screws are like visible just as like these things that are s screwed into wood. She said, that's so Japanese. And like, and I was like, I really, really want to go and understand that. And I guess, um, because I didn't, you know, I mean, I suspected that she was right, you know? And so, so that's what I mean about sort of being open and sort of wanting to sort of take that kind of stuff in. Okay. 
I think, I mean, I sort of know what you're saying. And I think, I think the one thing that is different is that, if anything, like when I describe sort of like these really weird processes that involve like, you know, taking tinfoil and like putting them in the bowls and like putting paint on it and like cutting it in half and hammering it and all this stuff. I mean, there is something that has a little bit of that kind of do-it-yourself kind of feeling to it, except that when I think about do-it-yourself things, I think about things that are functional. I think about things that are both like sort of could be artistic, but are mainly kind of they have some kind of like purpose, you know, like they do something. And I feel like my DIY stuff veers into this more kind of more or like I would just say less kind of functional space, which makes it which gives it a different kind of more like maybe slightly absurd feeling at times. But I know what you're saying, but I feel like that's the difference. Thank you.